song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, how many times have our eyes focused on challenges and trials, news? By the way, there ought to be a message on the meaning of gospel. Because it has to do with what? Good news. <laughs> Where have your eyes been? You've been troubled? Dif facing challenges, facing difficulties, not knowing how to deal with them? Are you a, a younger believer? Are you in learning? And, and, and in the questions, you know, as we, as we think about turn our eyes on Jesus, how do you do that? How, when this issue that I'm dealing with at work or this conflict in family or these other kinds of things is just staring me in the face, how do I turn my eyes to my Savior and find his glory and grace? How many of us know how to do that? How many of us have learned how to do that? How many of us enjoy the benefit of doing that? How many of us still have more to learn? <laughs> Please turn with me to Exodus 15. I'm so delighted to be here this morning and share this message with you. It's something God has worked in Lynn's life and in mine. And again, Ben, and, and it's not the same message that I preached July 23rd. I appreciate Pastor's reading this morning, and the way he read it surely shows the God of Israel in his powerful deliverance, incredibly awesome deliverance of Israel through the Red Sea. God defeated thoroughly, completely defeated the enemy and delivered Israel all in the same night in a most remarkable, unpredictable way. God delivered them from impossible so they would know him and serve him. Back to those trials that you were facing. What is the common question that we ask when we stub a toe or get a sliver? Why? You ever find the answer to that? No? Oh, okay. I could suggest a few. I would like to encourage us this morning to ask, to stop asking why. And instead, replace it with asking what. Okay, what do you mean? All right. So, God, what do you want me to do in this? Instead of, why did you let this happen? That sounds awful when you think about the God of Exodus 14 and 15. In John 3 and other passages, it sounds awful. Why did you let this happen? It is awful to complain against God. But to learn to ask the question, and I'm here this morning to, to, to share a story, but to share this passage, that learn to ask God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond when my flesh is screaming what I want? We need to tamp it down and say, God, what do you want? right here, right now, we'll talk about this. And I think you'll see how, and some illustrations in, in this. Let me think, let me share this with you too. A number of thoughts came together as I tried to prepare this for this morning. When we complain in trial, we may be disappointed with God. You ever think about that? When we complain in trial, I'm allowing for an out if you have an out. But we may be disappointed in God for allowing that to happen. Israel was complaining against God. When we complain in trial, we may be disappointed with God. On the other hand, totally other hand, when we rejoice in trial, we are delighting in God. Think of Paul and Silas in prison rejoicing after being beaten, sitting in perhaps the stocks and all of that. Very different outlook, right? Very different outlook. And did they honor God? Absolutely they did. 
And so how can we be more like them is, is part of what we're going to look at this morning. The big idea that I find in this passage in, uh, is, is to surrender more fully to God. Am I in charge of this now? To surrender more fully to God who teaches us to know him in bitter places. Think about that. I think you'll find God teaches us to know him on beautiful beaches. But he also teaches us to know him maybe more often in bitter places. For Lynn and I, I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, in, in 2013, I came up with this illness called Lyme disease. And after two years of dealing with that, by the way, we lived in, uh, on 115 Webster Road. Shelburne, Vermont. I was enjoying pastoring the First Baptist Church that used to gather in the building right across the lawn. And it was a joy to raise our children and to grow in love with God's people who gathered at that place. Uh, two of them were up here singing this morning and it's a great joy after those years to see them serving the Lord in this way. But at the end of 2015, because I couldn't function from weakness and brain fog, as a pastor, I had to resign. It was hard. It was sad that I was too sick to prepare the church for that transition. It was awful. It was hard to leave. It was hard to move. We prayed, and God provided a home for us in Antrim, New Hampshire. A friend owned the house, had thoroughly renovated it. It was beautiful. Amanda and Lynn and I moved there December of 2015. We moved there to get better. All three of us had Lyme disease and we got worse. Water damage happened both prior down in the basement cellar and then also in the upstairs uh, near Amanda's room and sickness just escalated. There were so many days home, and, and, and others in this room know what this can be like with mold or maybe cancer can be like this, I don't know, Lyme disease and other kinds of things. Our heart's gone out to them, to those of you who've struggled with that. And uh, churches were helpful and we enjoyed the fellowship of a number of churches, but uh, near the end of our time in, in New Hampshire, we, we attended and were members and served with New England Shores Baptist Church over in Hampton, New Hampshire, Pastor Tim Lewis and his wife Andy. Dear couple, dear sweet uh, body of believers there. Very encouraging and supportive. The mold illness got to me so much that I wasn't able to attend services in person because of the musty things in the building. If I did, I wouldn't be able to, I would be sick and not able to work the next day. So I'd sit in the car and sometimes friends would come out and visit and, and we would, I would listen online and so forth. And, and uh, there were reasons that we were highly motivated and not to actually move out of the house. My doctor said, Tom, I can't get you well while you're still in the house in Antrim. I'll help you keep working, but you're not gonna be you know, over this thing, but if you get out, you could be well in it's six to nine months. We bought an RV by God's grace, moved down to be close to our daughter who was uh, having another son and her husband was deployed and it was, it was a great, great experience to be in North Carolina. Liberty Baptist Church was, was also very uh, m meaningful to be a part of and to serve with them. As time went on there, the same thing happened and because of the AC running only on Sundays, I wasn't able to attend services in person because each time I did, I wouldn't be able to work the next day. I was too sick, too weak. So I, I served as one of the, for me, it was the most blessed opportunity to serve as a greeter on the porch. A lot to tell about that. I'll, I'll, con I'll continue on. The opportunity to meet in person went away 
because of the conditions in the building and I sat in the parking lot and listened online. Eventually we moved our home there and I was able to sit in air conditioning. And it, was, it was better, but that was only for a month. God helped us to endure those things, those times. Many times I'd be upset, discouraged, Lynn would be one of us, but many times there was this calm, trust, and rest, and seeing God strengthen and help and use us in spite of our wicked weaknesses. I don't mean wicked in the way of wrong, you know what I'm talking about. Studying this passage as a teacher, a Sunday school teacher here in Exodus, uh, while at New England Shores, uh, began to really guide my thinking and help me to grow and learn. I shared with you in July 23rd from a larger context, and uh, you know, three deepening steps to walking with God when the pressure is on, be faithful to God's word, be hopeful in God's word, be stabilized by God's word, and one idea there, one concept, is that there are times when God brings us to the edge of impossible so that he can powerfully provide for us or powerfully deliver us. And when he does it, it's not against us. It's to see his awesome power and for him to be honored. And that's good. So I asked the question when I came to this passage, how does God teach us to know him in bitter places? Ex Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. By the way, to complete the story, 21 members of Trinity Baptist Church help us move back into the same parsonage that we moved out of. And now we have new neighbors to minister to down on the lawn. Today, God put me back into the ministry. Please rejoice. Please rejoice with us. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah, or bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Let me ask the question again. It's great to ask questions of texts of Scripture that, that are in line with that, that help you to learn what's in the text. So I ask the question, what is, how does God te teach us to know him in bitter places? Well, he provided a solution. Moses Take this tree, throw this in the water, it'll be sweet. By the way, this is probably a very, very large pond, if not a lake. You say, why? I'm just, you know, trying to be practical. It was a nation that needed water. They couldn't stand in line at a garden hose <laughs> and survive. This was, this was a body of water of some kind that they could gather around and drink from. God provided a solution, and, and afterwards he makes a promise there, uh, verse, where am I? I'm in the middle of 25. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them, verse 26, and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. How does God teach us he, or in better places to know him? He provided a solution. He gave them a promise. Thirdly, we just read it, God instructed Israel how to, how to respond to him, how to relate to him. All in this bitter place. It's beautiful. These principles for the, which, the way God led. He instructed them. Listen to his word carefully, and he repeats himself in verse 25 and 6 and obey his command. The same thing happens in the wilderness of, of sin, verse, chapter 16, verse one, and they journeyed from Elam. All the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. I looked up the word sin just for information. It, I think it means thorn, at least in Strong's. So it's not the idea of disobedience, it's just uh, describing something about that place. The word also seems to be the prefix for Mount Sinai. 
the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we had sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, totally at the moment disregarding their complaining against him. I will rain bread. He, he gives a promise. He provides a solution. He gives a promise. And then he shows them how to, to gather. Gather this much and not this much. Gather on these days and not these days. Basic. Before, the, before Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments, very basic instruction on how to relate to God. This was like pre-K spiritual walking with God. <laughs> really. So the same. In Mara, God provided a solution, gave them a promise, and instructed them. The wilderness of sin, same. I want you to see something. Go back to Elam, that Myrtle Beach place, that lone pine campground. <laughs> Verse 27, then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. No pressure, no bitterness of challenge or trial, no recorded lesson. Doesn't mean God doesn't teach us in a beautiful oasis place but there is something here where God clearly worked in these rugged places. Think of the disciples that were in the water that was in their boat, usually not supposed to be that way. They were in the water, in their boat, on the Sea of Galilee. The storm was pounding, just, you know, pounding, pounding, pounding against that boat, and it was filling up. I could tell you a story about the peacocks and us trying to cross Mount, uh, cross, um, Lake Champlain, and we experienced something that started to look like that and turned around and went back for cover. But the stormy crossing of the Red Sea, what did the disciples learn that night? They woke their Savior, he stood up, spoke, and the, 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 the wind and the, the waves stopped. It was a duck pond out there. What did they, Jesus said, where's your faith? They were challenged in a bitter place. And what did they say of him? What kind of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Friends, would a beautiful sunset crossing of the Sea of Galilee have provided the same opportunity to learn that about the Lord? You see how God teaches us in bitter places? We don't like bitter places. We've all had them. The challenge is, how well have we learned about God and how well can we brag on God to others, teaching him what he has done for us? I'm going to use the outline that we found there. God provided a solution, gave a promise, and gave instruction and urged us to apply these three principles to our lives, which seem to be common principles for God's leading. We have to humbly accept the solution that God provides. For Israel, it was fresh water. In Marah, for Israel in the wilderness of sin, it was bread in the morning and quail in the evening. Plenty of food was going to be provided for them. Sometimes God removes the trial. Other times, you know, and there's a song that says he, sometimes he removes the mountain and other times he wants us to climb. We all know that. How relieving is it when God just, boom, the trial's gone? How enjoyable is it when we learn the lessons that he wants us to learn? Please go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. By the way, it's been a joy to be able to attend services with Lynn in person ever since coming back to Vermont. Second 
2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, God provides, sometimes he doesn't take the trial away. And here's an instance, verse 7. The Apostle Paul, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. There's a lot in this text. There's a lot. There's just an amazing things going on here. And the Apostle Paul says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This trial for Paul would not be taken away, but God strengthened him. That God's strength would be seen in him. There's a passage in the book of Acts that describes the Apostle Paul coming to the church and being um, weak and, and struggling to, to minister, and yet God worked through him. God worked in him, and God's working was seen by others, and God was honored in that process. The Apostle Paul accepted the solution. Do you see there in verse 9? And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I'm pretty sure he's summarizing. He, he's not giving a two or three page paper on this event this time. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. the sickness, the weakness, the struggle that he had that was a messenger of Satan to buffet him was something that Paul came to be able to boast about. Physical ailments, deformities, vision problems, other kinds of things can be used of God for other people to see him in us. Paul saw that and experienced it. And you and I have and can too. Let me say this, can we accept a chronic trial with strength from God? I recently asked one of our members, how do you work in times of poor health? The answer came back, by the grace of God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Beautiful testimony. God is with us, amen, through the ups and downs we can be who he wants us to be. I remember sitting on our couch in the living room on Webster Road, not able to go to the range when my family went and does a favorite uh, target practice event. And many, many other times, uh, just not homebound, many. And then the medical costs and other kinds of things happen. You lose another day's income, so many. We could have bought our camper outright. With, with lost income and medical expenses. And, and others of you have gone through similarly. I'm not, I'm just, I'm trying to tell about God how he dealt with us and taught us and encouraged us in a bitter place, in a bitter time. There came a time when I stopped praying for better health and began asking God to strengthen me to be who he wants me to be. Let me, let me take you to this. Some of us are disciplined in this area and others maybe not so much. We ought to know, meditate on, be confident in God and his promises. I'm using pastor's description of faith. Have confidence in God and his promises. Know, meditate on, and have confidence in God and his promises. Please go back to Exodus 15:26. The promise that God made that Israel could have held on to, should have held on to. And, and Exodus 15, 26 says, And said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you. God wasn't taking them there to die. He was taking them there to lead them to the land that he promised. 
Their eyes were not on the Lord Jesus Christ or on, on the Father who was leading them. Their eyes were on what they wanted, all me. If Israel, uh, one more promise, chapter 16 and verse 11, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them saying, at twilight you shall eat meat and in the morning you shall be filled with bread and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Wait a minute. Didn't they already know that God was their God? Didn't they already sing and rejoice in his delivering them from Pharaoh and taking them across the Red Sea safely? Didn't they already know these things? Well, yeah, sort of. I mean, they experienced them. But their knowledge of God and their confidence in God needed to be together. Where they were resting in God and it was changing, his word was changing their lives. If Israel grew confident in God and his promise, I think their complaining would have stopped. Chapter 17 would be very different. What about you? What about us? We have many promises from God. Let me, let me ask you this. How does a believer grow confident in God? Ever think that way? We ought to know. We ought to select. We ought to mark or write on a card or use a, a memory app on our phone or take a photo we ought to read over and over and over promises that we read of God in in our own Bible time promises that we hear in a in a message in a, in a life group lesson or discipleship group we ought to take these promises so glad that my father taught us to memorize around the table when I was a boy and the Christian school that I went to as well there was scripture memory so thankful for those disciplines instilled into us and still to this day when I come across another promise or I need to sharpen in my memory one that I you know I'm not remembering as well I can put it on a card and I can put it on my dash or someplace close by where I have it Lynn sometimes places them on a mirror put them in front of the kitchen sink all kinds of ways but we need to know them we need to meditate on the promises of God Jim Berg I appreciate his Bible teaching over the years. He compares biblical meditation to worry. There is a big difference, let me clarify, between biblical meditation and uh, world's meditation. Big difference. The world wants you to empty your mind, and biblical meditation says, let's put this in there better. Okay, that's, 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 where, we are, that's where we are right here. And, and worry, but these are two different activities that have two different outcomes, and one is right and one is wrong. So understanding all of that, what do we do when we worry? We take a subject, a possible subject, not even really happening. Shame on us. And we think about how it may affect our lives. In fact, we're pretty convinced that it's going to affect our lives. It's never happened, but you know, it, it's really going to mess us up. And, and it might be 3 o'clock in the morning, we wake up and we're still, and our stomach is getting, you know. And we're fretting and stewing and discouraged because we're worrying. We're thinking about how this event could affect our lives in this way, and that way, and this way, and that way. Do you see why Jim Berg compared meditation to worrying? Because to take a promise of God, fear not, for I am with thee, Many places that passage, that, that statement is made, but Isaiah 41.10 is one of them. And think about how that will affect our life, our life. Think about how that will change the way I think, the way I look, the way I behave, the way I witness or don't witness, the way, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing and how I stand for what is right in my workplace or my family or these other kinds of things where I'm, I'm trusting God and his word affects my life and I'm thinking about the way it affects my life. Me Paul said to Timothy, meditate on these things and it will, sh it will show the profitability of the word of God to other people when they see it in your life. Meditation needs to come back in full strength to your life, to your home, to mine. Meditating on the word, being 
being in the word, causing it to have a changing effect. It has the power to change our lives. Then we need to apply that promise to our, our situation. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be what? Anxious for what? Does that pretty much zero out all anxiety? Say yes. Nothing means nothing. Psalm 4610 is another passage that God used in our lives many, many times. Lynn has it on a plaque or two in the house. God burst into the writing of that psalm where the psalm writer had been speaking, and in the first person singular, God says, be still and know that I am God. And again, this concept of knowing that he is God is understanding that, yes, I, I'm anxious about this concern, but Lord, I'm going to take it to you, and I'm going to watch you work and see you solve this problem or see you give me the grace to endure it. That's how we know God for who he is. We're experiencing life with God. Do you do that? Do you think that way? He is more than having Bible time with, friends. God wants to have something to do with every aspect of your life all day long. And he's worthy. He is all worthy. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29, a great passage that God used in our lives. The Lord Jesus, after a busy ministry day, says to his disciples, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Yeah. Anybody need that? There have been times when we did that and the Lord unscheduled something that we were just, it was too much. Many times I've seen that happen. It's like, whew, good, I don't have to do that. Somebody called and said, oh, we're not going to be doing this. Okay, that helps. It wasn't always that way, but God showed us how to rest in him and know him. W would you do that? Would you play, please take the initiative? Post promises in your view. Read them over and over. Get back to meditating on the promises of God. We could walk out the door and forget about that and miss so much of what God has for us. I urge you to take the promises. God gave them to us for a solution to our day-to-day -day lives. Please, please, please take the promises of God home. Post them, memorize them, teach them to your children. Grow in the promises of God. Will you do that? Will you say amen with me? Amen. amen. This may be the tougher one. 16.2, God wanted Israel... And they journeyed, 16.1, let's go to 16.2. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and against Aaron in the wilderness. I won't read the rest of it, but Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. They would rather go back to Egypt. They would rather be in bondage than in freedom. They would rather be in cruel slavery than with God in the wilderness. There are times in your life and in mine, I suspect in your life, I know in mine, that I'd rather go back to something that is wrong instead of seeking God in the comfort that he gives. Israel did not seem to consistently acknowledge God in bitter places. And I pulled a word out of Proverbs 3, 5. Acknowledge him in all your ways. They did not acknowledge him. They weren't tuned in. They weren't acknowledging God. In fact, they did not ask, what does God want? They were screaming what they wanted, but did not ask, what does God want? No, Israel thought, it was, thought about only what they wanted and complained when they did not have it. Can I say this this morning in the hopefully an effective way? God is your God. As it was read about, he was read about in chapter 15. He is not our waiter. Where in the Bible does it say life is always good? We are not promised protection from accidents, illness, and conflicts with people. There isn't a passage that says it's going to be all peace and cream and, and easy going and LG, you know, appliances and all of that. <laughs> Even they break down. 
We live in a broken world that is under a curse. We, bad things are happening. Bad things will happen until the Lord returns. And complain, complain as if God should be protecting us from bad things and is not. No. 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 Israel was complaining and it was recognized that their complaining was against. The word is there several times. Against God. When we think that our complaining is actually against God. And may, maybe there's times when our complaining isn't against God, but, but when it is, we really need to pay attention. No, we're not to complain. But you know what? There is something that we are to do. There is something that we ought to, complace, we ought to replace complaining with. We ought to replace complaining with asking, God, what do you want from me in this mess? What do you want from me in this pain? What do you want from me in this illness? What do you want from me in this divorce? What do you want from me in this loneliness? What do you want from me in this name it? When we ask the Lord, what do you want from me? And learning to ask. In fact, let me, let me give you, I found this to be helpful in life. When I'm screaming something that I want, I'm learning to remember that I need to stop. That reminds me, wait a minute, that if I'm just screaming like somebody's in the, in the ER, everybody knows what they want. You want a good result. You know, when, when one of your teachers sprains his uh, knee or injures his knee at camp. And oh, by the way, they're at camp the hottest week of the summer <laughs> and without air conditioning. That What they want is clear. But I'm sure they also ask, God, what do you want? Kids to learn and grow, maybe get saved. God, what do you want? Learn to ask, what do you want, instead of, why did this happen? Do you get what I'm saying? Instead of screaming out, why did this happen, learn to say, oh, oh, wait, wait, I heard a message on this. Uh, I think it's humble to come before you, Lord, and say, what do you want me to learn? You know what happens when we do that and our heart does that? I want, I want you to see this picture. When we surrender, when we get to the place where we, okay, Lord, it's not about me, it's about you. Then we surrender and we behave in a way that honors him. Now we're no longer complaining against him. We're no longer, if we were disappointed in God, we're no longer disappointed in God. Now we're walking with God, which is what he wanted in the first place. Now we're surrendered, having surrendered obedience. Now we're delighting in him and in his in the same trial, but an incredibly different outlook. What comes next after surrender? Just generally speaking, peace. We're not against, we're at peace. We're not complaining, we're at peace. We're not all about me, we're all about God and with him at peace. You know that, you've experienced that. Surrender is so important, it's not just for teenagers. Whether it's big trials or little trials, let me, let me I think Jim Berg might have said this years ago, may have, may have said it since, but I remember hearing him say this. Galatians 5, let me take you to there mentally. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Next word? Meekness, self-control, right? The others are there. 
The idea is to evaluate where I'm at and use that, if you need to use that, as a simple summary guide of what does God want. That's what he wants. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, and so on. So if I, need, if I need to say, okay, God, I know what you want. It's here in the Word, and there are other, many, many others in the Word. It really helps to guide us in our thinking when we have a stubbed toe. I had a thistle in my thumb. I had no idea why it could be such a problem. That's why I eat plants now. <laughs> I don't want there to be thistles. Relate to work. These things go on. How does God want me to respond? I hope you're catching this. Every day we have dozens and dozens of opportunities to acknowledge God, to ask what does he want, to respond in a way that honors him. Dear friends, stop asking God why and learn to ask God what do you want from me. I, I want to share this in about a minute's time. Consider these illustrations of surrendering to God. I'll have to make this another message. How was Israel... Do you want to follow their example of surrendering to God on a scale of 1 to 10 so far in this? Maybe a 3. <laughs> Moses, I'm not, this, this is in the text of scripture, so it's not me versus him. This is the text of scripture recording. Was Moses surrendered to God in Exodus 3 when God sent him to talk to, to Pharaoh. And there was this lengthy conversation, and finally it ends with, please send somebody else. It's not me against Moses. The Bible illustration of surrender is a little, I hope I can be that good at surrendering to God, but as Moses was, but there's something not quite right. The Lord Jesus Christ, perfect example, of course. Abraham and Isaac. God says, take your son to a mountain. What did, Mo what did Abraham do the next morning? He got up early and left. He did it, 100%. That's what surrender looks like. You and I need to see that in our lives. God wants to see that in our lives more and more, more and more. And it affects where we are, when we are on Sundays and other times when the church gathers. It affects so much of our lives. Surrender to be here more. Surrender to be involved more. Surrender, surrender, surrender. How about the Apostle Paul? Again, that passage in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I rejoice in iniquity, in, not iniquities, I'm sorry. I rejoice in infirmities and these other things so that the power of Christ may rest. Amazing surrender. He got it. May we get it. Next time you want to say why, please say it with me. Ask what. What do you want me to do? Father, thank you for your word. Change us as much as you want. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. So we were challenged to look at the promises of God. Maybe many of you have seen it. There's a little booklet. I believe the title is God's Promises for Your Every Need. And it's just by categories and followed by verses that are promises. And so I encourage you to look at that. And uh, as he said, Lynn is done. Put the promise in front of your eyes. Put it on I guess it probably wouldn't be good to put it on the uh, rear view mirror of the car, but <laughs> we'll put it on the mirror of your bedroom and uh, put it on a three by five card and carry it around with you and consider those promises of God when you get into those times of worry.